Hello and welcome to this joint webcast by Asia Society Switzerland and the ADECO Group. My name is Nico Lufsinger and I'm the Executive Director of Asia Society Switzerland based in Zurich. So white collar employees in Asia and especially in Japan have for years been known as salary men, people who spent their entire career at one company and don't ever go home before their boss does. But this archetypical worker may become a thing of the past. In various Asian countries, a rethink of the approach to work is underway. Companies and governments are cautiously testing the idea of a four-day work week, as notoriously long working hours take a toll on staff with little to show in terms of productivity. Employees have fundamentally changed expectations of what they want to get out of their jobs, demanding a better work-life balance. And the pandemic really seems to have put this process on steroids. Singapore newspaper, The Straits Times, has recently branded what's happening now in the relation between companies and employers, the great renegotiation. So what do white collar workers in Asia want to get out of this renegotiation? Are companies, some of which are as big and complicated as nation states, able to adapt quickly enough? What role do governments play in this environment of changing work ethics? And is this really the end of the classic salary man? I'm happy today to discuss all of this uh, with our two esteemed guests, Ian Lee, who is the Regional President Asia Pacific at the ADECO Group, the co-host of today's webcast. Um, Ian is from Singapore and also normally based in Singapore, but today joins us from Italy. Hi, Ian, and welcome. Hello. And we're also joined by uh, Dr. Milan Jan Rahunat, um, who is an assistant professor of sociology at the Singapore University of Technology and Design and the author of Shaping the Future of Work, The Power of Collaboration in Times of Disruption. And as it just so happens, Milan Jan, who's also normally based in Singapore today, is joining us from London. So this is almost a European webcast. Thank you both for being here. Um, and I'm glad we could host this at a time when this would be convenient time zone wise uh, for, for you as well. Before we start um, the conversation with Ian and Milan Jan, um, I do want to say that we welcome any questions from our audience, um, which as always, you can please submit using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to reserve the last 15 to 20 minutes of this one hour conversation to audience questions at least. So I suggest we start with this idea, this image, this stereotype, this archetype of the salary man as it's sort of been exemplified in, in movies and, and books and just I think sort of the general notion and idea um, of Asia and especially of Japan. This image of the office worker first caught in a crushing morning commute and then in a fluorescent lit cubicle in a steel skyscraper only to never go home before the boss does late at night spending most of his or her time at the same company. Milan John, this is obviously a stereotype, but there is some truth to it. So maybe you can enlighten us and tell us a little bit when this salary man idea came to pass and why it's uh, developed so strongly in, in Japan. Thank you so much, Nico. So the idea of the salary man um, is obviously, it's not a myth. There is a lot of truth to it. And of course, you know, the country that comes to mind is Japan. Um, let's uh, go back uh, in time to sort of the post-World War II era, where, you know, Japan started to fervently industrialize. And, you know, new companies uh, were in the for forefront to provide uh, employment uh, in post-war Japan. And creating jobs that actually lasted a lifetime was of course very, very important. And culturally, um, it sort of became the norm to embrace um, high technology and at the same time, create jobs that were long-term, uh, lasted a lifetime. Um, it became very intertwined with um, the Japanese culture of security, uh, of stability, um, and that's what people did. That's what people wanted was uh, security. Of course, uh, the ideas of the salary man now have been seriously challenged uh, because of newer innovation models in companies. But I think that the idea still exists somewhat in Japan, perhaps, you know, um, in different avatars now that are coming up of the salary man. But I think it, it really shows... Um, what business models have been like 
you know, for the longest period in terms of trying to provide people with safe, secure, long-term employment. Uh, you join there uh, just after graduation. And of course, you never left until you retired. And maybe, you know, your company gave you a gold watch or something similar like that. But obviously, um, that has its ups and downs. Uh, one of the ups is, of course, you know, lifetime secure employment. Um, you always knew, like, which office to go to. And and um, it was very hierarchical. So, you know, your boss uh, most likely would have been um, older than you, uh, more experienced than you, and so on. And the downside of it, of course, is, you know, um, it stifles innovation, as uh, many companies are now finding out and then changing business models. So, yes, definitely uh, the idea is a very Japanese one, but I'm sure um, the same model was replicated in many other countries uh, across Asia because of the fact that, you know, Japanese companies uh, in the 70s and 80s, you know, became very global. Thank you. And maybe we can just follow up on, on this very last point, Ilanchan, with Ian. Uh, obviously, Ian, you covered the entire Asia-Pacific region for a decade, so you're well-placed to answer this question. Ilanchan uh, has told us a bit about where this idea comes from, and of course, it's, it's strongly, we strongly associated with Japan. Um, are there other Asian countries that also have seen a strong salaryman culture, and is the change that Ilanchan has described also on the way in these countries? Yeah. It's actually a very, very interesting concept of this, uh, what I call the salary man. Um, uh, I think um, Nilan Jan has done a fairly good job just now in terms of explaining what is a, what is a salary man. Um, and, and honestly, if I think about the rest of Asia, um, I, I think this is, this is probably tied to, I would say, two things. One, uh, the relative development of, uh, of the economy. And if you think about um, after World War II, Japan is probably, you know, the, the very, very first that started uh, with the, the, the industrial revolutions, you know, with uh, economy picking up and all those things. And then it, it, it just sort of like passed through you know, from, from Japan, if you think about Singapore, you know, think about my dad's time, uh, my mom's time, you know, I think a lot of people are looking for jobs and when they have the jobs, they want stabilities, they want, you know, <clears throat> uh, stabilities in terms of their income, they want stabilities income in terms of, um, you know, um, <clears throat> going to work, you know, and all those things. So <clears throat> it is not just a Japanese concept. However, if you think, Going down south into um, Australia, you, you know, into, into New Zealand, I think those economy also started, uh, especially Australia, I, I, I think they were more of a, a developed uh, nations. So, you know, that I see less in, uh, in, in that part of the world. Um, you know, I'm seeing, honestly, you know, the, uh, the India has gone through that phase and, um, you know, now it's, it's moving into a different phase. So I think this is probably tied to, number one, um, the economic development stages of economic development. I think there's also another second part, which probably related to, to, to culture, um, uh, to conformity in the culture. Uh, I think, Nilanjan, you are probably an expert in these areas. And if you look between Japan, Singapore, you know, um, in terms of, um, you know, the, the culture tightness, conformity, you know, if you are not conform, you get, uh, you get punished. And I believe that Japan is probably more towards that. that and there are actually in, um, in, in a lot of, uh, of, of a nation, if you go down south, like Singapore and all those things are, um, um, are fairly tight, you know, in terms of compliance. So um, that's how I see it. However, I'm also seeing a lot of changes. Thank you. And uh, we're going to want to dig in a bit on, on these changes and also on, on sort of the, the question on how Asia specific these changes and, and the reasons for them are. I do want to bring in some numbers here that I found quite staggering um, from different recent research. Um, it's been shown that in Hong Kong, only 28% of employees 
said that they were happy at work. Um, in Singapore, uh, only 27% of the workforce say they're happy. And in South Korea, only 21% of employees go happily to work while spending uh, an average of 1,908 hours working in 2020, which was 221 hours more than the OECD average. Nilan John, can you put these numbers in context for us? Is, you know, why does it seem that uh, these Asian workforces are quite severely unhappy? Where does that come from? I want to pick up on what Ian said about uh, the conformity culture. And I think the conformity culture uh, prevails very strongly, um, I would say, in, in Asian cult in Asian societies, uh, also um, sometimes with Asian managers. Um, the idea that the work culture is highly hierarchical. Um, typically, you just do your job, you, you barely ask questions. And what, what's happening is that the expectations of this so-called so like the stereotypical salary man has changed over time as we have new generations coming into the workforce, like millennials and now, of course, Gen Z, et cetera, where people want a voice in the workplace. Uh, they want fulfillment. Uh, they want more out of work than just a paycheck, you know, at the end. So in that sense, they feel sometimes that they're not heard. Um, you know, they can't feed back openly. Uh, they find it very stifling. Um, there are other reasons as well. Sometimes they feel, you know, uh, they asked for a promotion and didn't get one. They asked for a pay raise, they didn't get one. But it's, I think a lot of it is really to do about not you know, being seen, but, you know, not being heard. Uh, I think which is, which is a problem that at least the people that I've interviewed have told me that they're mm -hmm. not getting that fulfillment. And the other thing is, of course, um, people sometimes feel that they've taken on a job that they're not really the right fit for. Like, you know, because the expectations are very different from, um, say, the, the job advertisement that was posted or, that, you know, there's a misfit between sort of expectations and actual reality. So I think cult culture is a huge component of this uh, cultural um, and business model mismatch. Um, employer, employees uh, sort of not fully understanding each other. And of course, you know, changing times. Um, and one example I want to point out is See, the old variation of the salary man, of course, you know, um, went home after his boss went home, probably worked with, with, you know, paper and pen. But now think about it. Technology is supposed to have made our lives easier, but now we're contactable 24-7. <laughs> you, you can get you can get an email, you know, at five in the morning from your boss. And most likely than not, you know, you most like, you know, you will reply or, you know, you might be contacted on the weekend, or you may be asked to do many things. So, so I think now it is in so many ways, it's liberating, but in so many other ways, um, our work lives um, have become uh, quite uh, intense. And as a result, you find that some people who haven't uh, found their own sort of sweet spot uh, in terms of their ideal job uh, and their ideal career, uh, oftentimes feel they're unhappy. So, you know, I'm not surprised to see those numbers. Thank you. Well, we've talked quite a bit now sort of about the employee side of this and, and, and the reasons why these employees may, may feel so unhappy. But Ian, there's of course also the employer side. And I would think that with so many employees on average so unhappy, you know, that would obviously affect the employer as well and the company as well. So historically, how high has awareness among employers been for, for numbers like this? And, and is that something that you see changing? Do employers in the region care that their employees are also unhappy? Yeah. I Okay. Um, Nico, put it this way. Um, I, I believe that, uh, that Asia is not... Uh, uh, a, a, Asia are still relatively new to the world of management if you if you think about <laughs> east and west okay so you know and um, if you think uh, that uh, uh, where asian stands usually it is still at the 
you know, mini, uh, uh, if you think of, of, of Asians in general, huh, we are thinking about, um, you know, uh, plant managers, country managers, you're not definitely the West. Okay, so, you know, you are still, even on the management level, you are still sort of like in the, in, in, in the, in the middle. So, you know, then there is also this conformity, you know, I want to be more regimentals, you know, you, you follow certain models. Uh, we are also not, uh, honestly, the best from a creativity standpoint, if you think from that aspect of creativity of management. And um, honestly, also, Nicole, work-life balance is still relatively um, new concept in, in Asia. So when you add all those things up, um, you know, I think we still have a long way to go. That's, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, one thing I've wanted to ask about, because it seems to me related to this concept of the salary man, is a, a, a somewhat similar concept that's been popular in China for the last few years before there's, uh, there's been a little bit of a, of a crackdown of sorts from the government with, and it's usually referred to as 996. It's a concept that uh, at least used to be very popular among Chinese tech firms. And it would refer to the fact that people were expected to work from their employers, but also from, from their peers to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. So every day on, until, uh, on, on, except for Sunday. It, Ian, to which extent do you see this 996, which, and I find it interesting because it, it came out of tech firms and it came out of very new, fast growing modern companies. This was not something invented by state owned enterprises who would sort of maybe more conservative reputation. To which extent is this concept related to this concept of the salary man that we've been discussing? And what do you make of the fact that it's been actively sort of actively fought by the Chinese government as of last year. Yeah, you know, um, Nico, I think we are talking about a slightly different thing over here, okay? Mm -hmm. um, um, the, the types of culture uh, that uh, the, the tech company was, uh, was, I say, I use the word uh, was, because uh, it was actually noticed by the government. Uh, in fact, I would say the salary man concept probably apply more to the SOE um, because you know uh, you are talking about a, a group that 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 needs to be conformed. However, I would say the driver of uh, the tech firm um, are, are driven by competitions. Mm -hmm. um, are driven by you know they need to get like you know multiple times of growth in order to be able to sustain their stock prices and all those things so it's it's, it's competitive it's it's competitive nature in fact that that sector in china is very very competitive and you know they they, they were able to get the cream de la cream from the universities um, in China, um, you know, so everyone wants to go to Tencent, everyone wants to go to Alibaba, everyone wants to go to tech. So, you know, it's, it's competition between business, it's competition within people. Uh, I, I believe that's probably more driver uh, than, uh, than, than because, you know, the company wants people to work uh, from nine to six. So, and you can see that that is also part of the, 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 I would say, attention that the government is given to the tech because they have gotten to be so big. And then they start questioning whether this types of culture is the right one. I mean, really, they are getting to be very, very big, those tech firms. And they are into every day, your everyday lives. That's how I see it, Nico. Thank you. Um, we've already spoken a little bit, and I want to go further on this, on you know, sort of the, the underlying macro trends that, um, that fuel all the changes that we've, that we've been discussing. Um, you mentioned, of course, economic development, which is a kind of very basic effect that as economies develop and sort of also as, um, as companies change, as jobs change, that also, of course, has an effect on work culture. But you also said that there's a, you know, a, a specific cultural aspect to this that maybe is more specific to, to Asia or at least to, um, to East Asia where there's maybe more of a, of, of a conformity in culture. And you know, John, I do want to ask about other factors. One that comes to mind would be demographic shifts, which again, it's not particular to Asia, but 
at least in some Asian countries, that shift is most pronounced when we think of Japan, but also increasingly China. Um, think of South Korea, those are all countries which struggle um, so with large demographic trends, which of course then has an impact just on the availability um, of, of employees and of talent. To which extent does this shift and sort of the increased scarcity um, of the workforce play into what we're seeing here? Well, I think there are two um, major shifts happening. One is, of course, uh, in some of these countries, there is an aging population. Um, some of the some of the other countries in Asia, like say, for example, India, um, has a younger population. Um, but say um, for Japan, Singapore, etc., it's an aging population. So there, there are these different trends. But at the same time, if you look at the current workforce, um, it is millennials who are largely represented, you know, in the current workforce, probably in the biggest um, numbers. You know, if one did a survey, that's what, um, and there are a lot of surveys out there, you know, from uh, Deloitte to everyone, you know, does these surveys like every single year. And you can see that uh, essentially, the work culture has changed towards, um, I mean, I would argue that almost every company is now trying to become like a tech company, you know, even though they're not doing tech. It, it, it's a question of uh, trying to bring in more of that level of productivity, innovation, creativity. And also, I mean, it's a struggle. I think for some uh, companies that are very traditional, it's a struggle, but, they, you know, they realize that uh, a culture that's more open, uh, for example, um, brings in more innovation and et cetera. So I feel there is this sort of um, a struggle for some companies to actually embrace this in a big way, uh, the openness, uh, the flat hierarchies of tech companies. At the same time, I think uh, there is definitely like a drive uh, towards that because that's what younger people uh, you know, they want to work for that. So um, when you go to recruitment events in a lot of these companies, you find that younger people are very attracted to companies, uh, you know, that promise this kind of open culture. Um, simple things like, you know, uh, I can work from anywhere. Um, I don't have a dedicated office space or I can actually work from home on certain days or I can wear jeans on Friday. You know, these things matter a lot. Uh, so you find that certain companies are, of course, drawing a lot of the talent in. And, and other companies, you know, then they struggle because, you know, they, they can't find enough people uh, to come and do that. And that is also like, I, I just want to bring in another very important factor here, and that's automation because how automation has really shifted the kinds of skills uh, that, that people need because you know these skills are constantly changing. So there is competition for talent and then of course the right kind of talent and then worrying about how do we retrain this talent, you know, keep them up to mark and also uh, people changing the jobs continuously. Um, and then what do countries do? They start to rely on migrants to fill some of these jobs because they can't, you know, they may not have enough people of their own, unless, of course, it's like a very big country like India or China, which is a whole other story. But um, like, for example, in Singapore, right, we always have a talent crunch. We need people uh, to fill in uh, many sectors. And then, then, of course, it is also then about keeping your population <laughs> happy, uh, justifying to them why you need all this uh these migrants to fill in these jobs. And that's no easy job for mm -hmm. any government to do. Thank you very much, Jan. And, and again, as before, um, I also want to switch perspective from, you know, to, to look at this from an employer's perspective. Ian, you manage a fairly large business across the region. And I'm sure you know, among the people that you manage, there are plenty of millennials and, and Gen Zers. So largely you know, in your experience and average, are they more difficult to manage? What is different in terms of um, employing these generations versus uh, maybe previous generations? What are sort of the, the key experiences that you've made? Yeah, they, I, would, I would not say they are more difficult to manage because if I say they are more difficult to manage, I think nobody is going to come and work for a deco. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I would basically say they are different, 
um, they think differently. Um, you know, I think just now Nilan uh, hit the nail on the head. You know, um, it, in fact, they expect to wear jeans to work every day. You know, we have to tell them what is professionalism. We have to teach them all those things. Um, they, they, you know. However, however, I think uh, the work culture overall is also changing in this part of the world. Um, you know. And, 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 and Nicole, you are right that uh, COVID actually accelerated a lot of things. I'm going to give an example of Japan, which honestly is an epitome of what I see changes. Okay, I have never imagined that one day I see in Japan that um, you know, people are truly, truly working from home. I've been... I've been working for 30, 30 plus years, and I can tell you this is the first time. I, I, I never expect in my generation to see this, that the Japanese did not care whether they are with the boss or not. You know, and they did not care actually, you know, at one point of time we were, a hypothesis is that the Japanese man have to come to the office or work, even if he did not have a job, he will have to leave home, else the wife will find him to be useless. You know, again, in, Ch in Japan, what we see is that, um, you know, 70% of my workforce, my, my full-time employee actually come, uh, work from home. 70%, which means only 30% of the people works in the office. So it's a completely different change in mindset in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's, I, I see millennials, or even, you know, people are changing their work habits, you know, in terms of their demands and all those things. And the very telling one starts from Japan. And if Japanese can change, I think, you know, I think it's even bigger from the rest of the rest of Asia. And Ian, let me follow up here because I think you, you said an interesting thing there. So you said part of this is also, you know, there was this and have gender stereotypes uh, previously in Japan where the man had, so was expected to leave the house every day to go to work, even if there was no work to go to. And, and you see that shift. To which extent does gender play a role in this? So is this also because um, uh, female labor participation has actually increased in Japan in recent years? So it's sort of the more, probably we don't want to yet say it's sort of balanced because of the, the, the increased um increased percentage of, of women going to work uh, in Japan and other Asian countries contributing to this trend as well? Yeah. Nico, I, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting research topic. I did not have empirical evidence because it's, is it driven by the change in demographics between men and women? Okay. Um, you know, but, but um, said that can be one of the reasons, but I think it's more of a mindset, huh? more of a mindset change that office is a different concept versus uh, versus the past. Work is a different concept versus the past. I think that's probably a bigger driver versus, you know, because of the change in demographics. But Nico, I can tell you, I think there's also something that uh, pertaining to our Asian cultures uh, versus the Western cultures. If you think about this, our young people, um, you know, in, in the West, let's say in the US or UK, you know, they go to universities, after universities, they are considered as independent, they will not stay with their parents. Mm. Okay. However, in the Asian cultures, um, you know, especially in, uh, in, in East or in, in, let's say in Southeast Asia, um, you know, your independence will come probably much later than the West. So those are things that, um, you know, uh, your, your parents are still watching you, you know, even if you're 35 years old, which is unheard of in the Western world, okay? So, you know, those are the things that, uh, you know, I think it, there is a difference in, in, in terms of the behaviours and all those things. Coming to office might be, might be a release or an escape away from home. <laughs> Ian, I'm very, very glad you brought up the parents because I was going to ask uh, Nilanjan about this anyway. So Nilanjan, you, you, you commented on this uh, a while ago in, um, in, in a different setting, and I found this interesting, right, that there's, the way I interpreted this is there's almost, almost a tension between the demand of millennials and Gen Zers for more flexibility, for more adaptability, but also, and we can talk about more about this later, 
about this idea that, you know, sort of there's more to work than just, you know, climbing the ladder and earning a salary. It has to be filled with meaning. So this is on one side, but then there's tension between this and the perhaps more traditional views that these people's parents may hold, where, you know, there's still sort of the, the pinnacle of work is having this straight line career in one company. From, from the research you do and the interviews that you've conducted with, um, with employees, Nilan John, how does this tension play out? How do, and how do people navigate the tensions, not just with their employers, but also with, with their parents as they try to sort of change the way they work? Uh, I think certainly this tension uh, does exist um, because when I interviewed uh, millennials uh, and I interviewed millennials of you know different ages, people just entering uh, their first job versus people already in their job, like say for five years, et cetera. And you can always see that the parent family component is always there. Um, and this is interesting because um, like Ian said, like it's not there. I would I would say it's that in in the West, you know. I mean, sorry to stereotype the East and West like this, but um, when I interviewed people in the in the U.S. Um, in in one prestigious school in the U.S., that never came up. It was never about what does my family think about what I'm doing. It's what do I want, right? Whereas. Uh, in the Asian context that I was looking at, it was that before I would say it was like, what do my parents want? Now the tension is, what do my parents want and how can I make them agree to what I want? And so it's, is this thing like, uh, I would say like this grand negotiation uh, between uh, what, what my parents have told me, what they've socialized me. And it's not just parents, it's also uh, the broader society, the culture, like uh, there is some expectation that, you know, that you will do certain things that like you, you will, you will earn money. Uh, you would have like benefited, say, from the meritocratic system and you're going to give back something to society. So that's very strong as well. It's like, I can't afford to be a loser. You know, I have to do something that society approves of. Now, sometimes this translate into like, oh, I have to get a job in an MNC or a bank or whatever. But I could see like a slight shift in those dreams. Like, you know, it's an out, still an outlier kind of thing, but people telling me, well, I want to be a professional YouTuber. <laughs> I mean, think about that, right? To a lot of parents, that's like, oh my God, they probably have a heart attack saying, I want to be a professional musician or a YouTuber or an artist. But that's kind of slowly creeping in uh, not at the cost of saying, okay, I will not work in a regular job, but I will do the regular job and add this. So there's like a some kind of a balancing act going on between I'll try and please myself and my family, but there's definitely a shift there because at least people are saying that, you know, I want to try and please myself as well. My career ambitions versus um, saying, you know, it's only going to be that of my parents. So there is a shift there. And some actually told me something interesting. For the first five years, I'll do what my parents want, then I will shift. <laughs> so I will move on to something after I convince them. Yeah. Uh, the other interesting point here is, of course, you know, um, not just choosing careers that are different because technology makes alternate careers, you know, even possible, which we couldn't think of before. But secondly, it's also about entrepreneurship, like how young, you know, uh, can you be uh, to actually run a startup? Now the age is going down, right? Before it was people like, oh, let me get a few years experience, contacts, work in a, in a good company. Then I will become an entrepreneur. Now it's like they're barely done with college and they're like, I want to do a startup. So that again is taking a shift because, you know, their parents are not too happy about them taking a risk at such a young age. Uh, where they don't have job security. But I can see this in Asian families, this kind of negotiation now going on, which is a very interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Ian, I want to ask about sort of some of the, the very prominent aspects of how culture is changing. And, and I think that's the, the one that's usually being mentioned that's came up a couple of times in the conversation as well, of course, is working from home. And uh, as you've mentioned, the pandemic, of course, is, has played a big role in 
popularizing this idea and showing companies sometimes and, and employees against their will sometimes that this can actually work. My sense just from you know, observations here in Europe is that the picture is sort of ambiguous. Um, well, in a lot of organizations, a lot of companies work from home, at least partially is here to stay. There have been plenty of examples also from companies demanding or strongly suggesting that their employees come back. Can you give us a high level picture if that's at all possible on, you know, in the region Asia and whether there are any regional differences, how widespread is working from home and do you expect it to, you know, to become even more widespread or to stay as widespread as it is right now? I know that you said, you know, it's, it's, it's common for you, it's common at Adeco, um, but of course there are plenty of other companies and, and the picture may not be quite as clear um, across the region. Yeah. So, Nico, um, I, the, the way I'll put it is this, um, you know, the days of um, working in the office for completely, <laughs> you know, is over. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's that, that for sure is over. So, you know, um, in the past, you expect people to come to work five days, six days, you know, in the office, you know, uh, to, to promote group activities and all those things are done. And that's actually the only thing I would say is, is, is quite certain. The rest, I think there's a, not just a cultural things. Huh? I think there is also, you know, a big difference in, in terms of the space. If you think about Asia, when you are living in an apartment, let's say in Hong Kong, I think about this. You are living uh, an apartment in Hong Kong if you have a 50 meter square house. It's not considered as small. It's, it's reasonable size. But I would say if you think about 50 meter squares for a family of three or four in Switzerland, just imagine. In Zurich, just imagine. So the, the space constraint is also different. And, and if, if the, the, the pair, the both, both um, you know, um, um, uh, the husband and the wife are working from home, you just think about in a 50 meters square space. That is, uh, that, that, that in, in itself is, is a restriction. And I'm not talking about just Hong Kong, huh? space in Singapore, you know, and all those things. These are countries that space is at a premium, even, you know, even, even China. So working from home has a positive connotation, but working from home has also a negative connotation. Just now I, I talk about, you know, what I'm certain is people want a little bit of flexibility, but if I'm telling people not to come to work for five days, I've also encountered issues. Mm. So people uh, are human beings. Human beings are actually also group animal. Okay. They, they also are afraid that they get left out. So, you know, I think it's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I think the argument that you're making in with space is, um, is very good. And I, I hadn't really considered that, but of course it makes a lot of sense that there's a limit to the attractiveness of working from home. If home is just not such an attractive workplace and that's strongly um, allocated with space. I'm wondering, I don't know if there's any data in this, but I'm wondering whether to which extent the distance of the commute would also factor into this, right? So it seems that compared maybe to at least some of the European cities, these big Asian cities that you've mentioned, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's Singapore, whether it's Tokyo, they suffer from comparatively less space. So people will be more constrained at home, which may make working at home less attractive. But then it stands to reason that they also have longer commutes, right? So that they would, if they have to go to the office, they would have to spend more time commuting versus, you know, if you live in a relatively small European city, do you have a gut feeling of sort of how these two trends interact because they seem to run against each other? One sort of making working from home less attractive, the other more. Is there one that's gonna it's gonna eventually sort of come out on top? I honestly, Nico, I do not think that. Um, um, I think there are a few factors that are in play over here. Okay, distance is also one. Um, you know, um, um, space at home is also another one. And, and also the other thing, um, which is quite Asian, is, you know, when, when you finish school and you started working, you usually are also staying with your parents. Mm -hmm. And it's 
actually unheard of in in the Western world. Huh? You, <laughs> you know, if you are staying in, with your parents after a certain age, you are viewed as a failure. Put it this way, uh, in, in in a lot of Western countries. So you know, I think there is not just one factor. There are a couple of factors at place over here. Now, which one is because it, I mean there are people that have kids. And, um, you know, when, when you, you have young kids also, it's another factor, okay? And just think about when there was lockdown, everybody was at home in a very small space. That, that, is, that can actually make people feel, feel crazy. That's why there, there are a lot of mental issues we talk about. Why we need to care about mental. Those are the things that, that are in play. And honestly, I see lesser of that in the West versus the East, huh? From a space, from the the the, the democrat the demo, uh, demographic context standpoint that I talk about, I'm not sure whether Nilan Nilajan, you agree with me. I I I re- really agree with you because I think uh, the fact is sometimes people want to get away from the house. You know, uh, in in some Asian societies because it's too much. Like you said, you know, people. Uh, are living with their parents. Sometimes it's too much. There's no privacy. They can't do what they want. So so if you think about the commute, I think sometimes people don't mind that as opposed to the fact that they they want something different. They want to be outside, right? Uh, they don't. And uh, in the pandemic, for example, <clears throat> people found it difficult in a small space to all be working together. You know, it, it. I think it drove some people crazy, like you know that they didn't have the privacy to uh, sort of you know make a Zoom call or do something because so many people were sharing that space and you know they had just limited number of devices at home. You know, depending on which country they were living in. So I think uh, we have to view this as a trade off, right? Um, it, it depends on uh, what kind of resources you have available uh, on your hand. Thank you. Um, I do want to ask one last question and before we move on to audience questions. So um, if you do have a question to both of our panelists and haven't submitted it yet, um, you can do so under the Q&A box and, and we'll get to those in a minute. Before we get there, though, Ian, one thing that I find interesting is that we've been kind of talking about this shift. And I think one aspect of the shift that we've been discussing is of course decreased loyalty from the employee towards the employer. People don't stand with a, uh, stay with a company for all their lives. They may change jobs every once in a year. And I think broadly you know, in this conversation, but also elsewhere, this is seen as a positive trend, right? It makes the, um, the marketplace more flexible. It allows for people to develop in different directions. It allows for companies you know, to, to get the talent at the time that they need it. But there does seem to me one possible drawback of this, which is that at the same time that all of this is happening, it also becomes increasingly important uh, to invest in continuous learning um, and to make sure that people you know, don't just stop when they when they leave school in terms of getting educated and getting trained, but this is a much more continuous process. And it seems to me that as a company, if you can assume that you know, most of your employees are going to be leaving after a certain number of years, three years, five years, seven years, and not stay with you for extended periods of time, wouldn't that also decrease your incentive to invest into learning? So that seems like a little bit of a tension there where we, on one hand, should increase our investment into continuous learning, but maybe have less of an incentive to do so because of this um, uh, this increased flexibility. Does that tension even exist? And if so, would you see ways to address it? Um, <clears throat> Nico, you raise a very, very interesting question. However, let, let me put things in perspective. Um, you know, uh, this is like um, a, a, a uphill battle. Huh? Um, uh, if you are climbing and you stop, you actually go down. Okay. Um, why did I say that? Right now, because of technology, you talk about AIs, you know, machine learnings and all those things. A lot of jobs, uh, being 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 re- replaced by 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 machines by by technologies and um, you know however there are new areas that are coming up like for example data is data is one you know uh, think about the data that we have today even versus yesterday 
it, it, it's growing at a gazillion types of pace. And then, you know, think about 10 years ago. So things are changing. Unfortunately, if a company did not change, it is going to die. That's how I see it. So from that simple reasons, there's also another factor at play right now. Right now, everybody is facing a talent crunch one way or the other. So, you know, you can continuously go out and get people or you can also retrain your people to be doing a different jobs because the cost is getting higher and higher to go out and higher all the yeah. times. So I think, you know, it, it, it will become a national exercise for everybody to be continuously improving because yeah. if you're not, uh, you're dead. That's how I see it, uh, Nico. Thank you. Uh, Niranjan, any any additional comments? Um, yes, um, I think uh, retraining is now on you know most countries' agenda, especially uh, countries that are going you know fast on the automation road, because they realize that you know you don't have a, a population that can retrain, then you're in trouble because a uh, companies are not going to find the workforce that they need, and you know they're going to fall behind and and definitely many companies will have to pack up. But I think as far as retraining is concerned as well, I think it's also an individual responsibility because, you know, companies can't do everything. Uh, it's also an individual to sort of stay um, up to date and relevant. And I think this is what uh, this is going to be uh, the new route to sort of social mobility and economic success is like, you know, companies, um, you know, working with government, you know, to have the necessary retraining capacity, right, for various jobs, because jobs are changing so fast because of technology. And on the other hand, sort of individuals taking on that agency uh, to sort of self-improve themselves so that they stay relevant. Thank you. Um, let me bring in some of the questions from the audience. And the first one kind of asks about risks and drawbacks of this increased flexibility, not just in terms of uh, changing jobs, but you know, the, the general work arrangement, be that work from home or flexible work times or four hour work weeks. So uh, Nilan Jan, maybe, maybe asking you first, you know, what are the risks and drawbacks that you see in sort of these changes? And is there a line that needs to be drawn or do you see companies sort of drawing a line where they say, well, you know, we're, we're willing to give you this much flexibility, but no further. Is there such a thing as too much flexibility, I guess, would be another way to put the question. I, I think so. I mean, uh, depending on what business model the company has. I mean, on the one hand, flexibility seems to be like, you know, there's no turning back right now. But on the other hand, some companies are asking their employees to come back because they're paying such huge rents, you know, for the real estate that they're hiring. It's not, it's not cheap to have offices. Um, you know, uh, particularly in prime locations around the world. And uh, some companies worry about the productivity, you know, how do they measure productivity of people staying at home versus if you're physically in the job? I think it's the nature of what the company is actually doing. Like, are you like, you know, services, manufacturing, uh, you know, tech, whatever. So there, there is this tension. I don't particularly believe that there's this perfect combination of how long the work week should be or should it be hybrid or not. Um, I guess it's a lot to do with what does the employer want, what does the employee want, and what's a good fit for them. So I, I guess every company will have to figure out their own, I don't know, recipe for this. Mm -hmm. uh, in line with national policy, <laughs> of yeah. course. Ian, Ian, are you aware of any don't have to give us names. Are you aware of any companies that have, you know, even maybe rolled back uh, flexibility requirement in the on-chain? Of course, you mentioned that you know, some companies are asking people to come back from, from home again. Are there other sort of examples of companies like going almost too far in their quest of becoming more attractive to, to millennial and Gen Z workers and that's sort of having to roll that back because it just didn't work? No, it's... Uh... Okay, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, you know, within my, 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 my remit of, um, of, of, of business, there are some countries that uh, we were actually uh, prescribing people to come, uh, come to work for two days at the minimum. 
Uh, and we are actually moving it into three days. Um, you know, we talk about uh, we talk about drawbacks. I, I I can tell you, drawbacks sometimes is is you know um, the lack of personal touch, um, you know, collaborations. Those are things that are very very important uh, for for business to to progress. And um, you know, and sometimes you just you just can't just do it over Zoom or over Teams, yeah. okay? And um, unfortunately, you know, the performance management systems, you know, um, the, it all depends on, on, on the levels that you have. Huh? Uh, you are at a higher level, maybe, you know, you can, um, you know, it's a results-driven types of, the more, the, the, the higher you go in the corporate hierarchy, it's about, you know, how you deliver the outcome in terms of your profits, you know, in terms of your sales and all those things. But when you go down the hierarchy, it's not that easily defined that this is, this is attributed to you. So, you know, there are, the, the, I'm, I'm seeing that not only us, when I was talking to friends, uh, to, to, to people in the industries or outside the industries, you know, we are saying that it's, there's no prescribed rule in terms of whether you should have one day, you should have two days, you know, or, you know, you should prescribe one of the days is a team days and all those things. So that, 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 for sure, there are some that are actually moving back. But again, the only thing that I said just now that I, I can confirm is flexibility is here to stay. So it's, it's, that's all. But how many days that you need to come to work, you know, and all those things. What really is work is also a different thing. Nicole, the last time I was in Europe was March 13th of 2020. Okay. And I can also tell you from March 20 until now, last week was the first time I came back to Switzerland. Okay. And, um, you know, there are first time that I, I see people that I've, I've been working with for two years, for what, the past one year. And that there's some in, in, in interesting remarks that I was uh, making. Wow, you are so big. Wow, you are so small. <laughs> So, you know, I think people are human beings. Human beings still need human touch. You know, so those are, those are importance. You, you can't you can just define a human being by the screen. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to end the conversation with, with one topic that we, we sort of excluded until now, but I think it's important. Um, that is on the role of governments. Um, so as sort of work ethics are changing as the marketplaces, the workplaces are changing. Um, and Ian, maybe you can, you can, you can answer this first and then we'll, we'll go to Milan John. What is the role of a government in, you know, sort of to ensure um, that these marketplaces work smoothly to ensure that companies uh, can be productive, that employees um, uh, have their rights. Is there anything that needs to change from the government perspectives in response to these changes that we've been discussing for the past hour? Um, Nico, probably I start first and I'll, I would love to hear what Milanjan think about this. I felt that, you know, the other thing that I am for sure is this gig economy, you know, uh, types of uh, work is, is here to stay. Okay? Now, it is important for the government to recognize this because, you know, there are also things that consequences of this, uh, social security, safety net, social safety nets needs to be there to recognize this is a legitimate form of work mm. that is also protected. I think that's fundamentals as I see it. Okay. Um, you know, then I would basically say there is also another thing that government can facilitate that I felt the Singapore government has done pretty well. It's regarding just now when you talk about rescaling, um, mm -hmm. the government can, can play an a, a active role to, to, to make that sort of like a national activities, you know, uh, a lifelong learning is important for people. It's an investment in your, in, in, in your future because your, your, you know, today, if you study finance as an accountant, I'm not sure whether, uh, you know, the lifespan of accountant can be 30 years from now. 
So those are things that uh, I felt that government need to recognize and can do better. Thank you, Neelan Jan. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I agree with that because I think um, governments a need to be more proactive. Uh, you know, like like you know, it can't just be like you know, uh, tech companies. Uh, you know, like say the big tech companies. You know, they can't be just be the ones running the world. You know, that that's something we need to think about. Like, so in other words, I think governments really need to be up to date in terms of what's happening. Um, in terms of innovation and make sure uh, that the necessary infrastructure um, is in place so that citizens, you know, who want to upgrade can upgrade their skills. And and companies, for example, that want to upgrade can also upgrade, uh, you know, their technologies because otherwise I think what will happen is uh, economies will fall behind. This is a very big challenge. So, so in other words, I mean, in Singapore, uh, you know, we have this uh, very big endeavor called the Skills Future, uh, which is really available widely to the population. It doesn't matter who you are, what your socioeconomic background is, you can access it, right? And and so the thing is, um, it's easy to access. You know, it's not like it's not like I have to like search and fiddle around, you know, to actually know what this is. It's so well. Co- organized and communicated to the wider population that everybody knows that they have a certain number of credits and they can use it, right? Um, of course, more research needs to be done as to see like, you know, how to encourage more people to take on these things and what should they be doing, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, I guess no, no one can be forced to do these things. It's just that the opportunities, I think, need to be made available, um, especially because there are so many jobs that are uh, right now at the high risk of elimination uh, because of automation. So, you know, retraining is one way to go. And um, the other thing is, of course, um, having conversations with the stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders? Of course, you know, you can think about industry, citizens, right? So there are different stakeholders in any economy. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody follows the same model. Each country will have their own uh, needs and definitions of these things, but I think it's so important to have con- you know transparent conversations with stakeholders and say, look, you know, uh, what do people actually need? You know, and it's not just what what do people want. That of course is important, but what do I, you know? What does the population need to stay economically uh, relevant? And of course, economic relevance uh, goes hand in hand with social cohesion, right? You can't have one without the other. So, A, you want to keep your population cohesive at the same time, uh, provide uh, the opportunities for them to actually have a better life, right? Um, and and I think that, so in that case, governments play a very important role uh, in at least creating opportunities, um, you know, according to whatever system they have in place in a particular country. Thank you very much, Yunan Jan. Um, it's always quite difficult, you know, to to try to summarize uh, wide-ranging conversations uh, like this. But here at the end, if I think you know, the the key things I'm taking away from this very very insightful conversation is that, as so very often, the trends we are observing in Asia broadly, you know, are, are similar to the trends that we're observing elsewhere. But because of Asia's uh, size because of its diversity, um, they may just be a little bit more pronounced, um, and, and they may be uh, somewhat harder to manage. Both when you know, talk about sort of um, looking at countries with with very different demographic trends, but also you know with this, this question, uh, I like this term very much. You know, use at the end of infrastructure to allow people, but also companies, to upgrade their skills as we go forward. Um, I do think that's a that's a highly interesting term. So. Thank you very much, uh, Milan Chan Raghunath and uh, Ian Lee, for taking time of, uh, out of both your European trips. Um, uh, I you know, acknowledge that you know that's something that doesn't happen all that often, hasn't happened so often in, in recent times. So thank you for taking the time uh, while traveling to Europe to speak to us. This was incredibly insightful. Um, thank you again also to Adeco Group for co-hosting today's conversation with us. Um, I think there's plenty of things to take away and, and most importantly, plenty of open questions uh, that we can address the next time we speak. So thank you again um, to Ian Lee in Italy and Milan Jan Rakunat in London. And thank you to everybody who's joined us today. See you next time. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Ian.
Bye-bye.